This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman, as we end the show with the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. He was assassinated April 4, 1968, at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, just 39 years old. While Dr. King is primarily celebrated as a civil rights leader, he championed the cause of the poor and organized the Poor People's Campaign to address issues of economic justice. He was also a fierce critic of U.S. foreign policy in the Vietnam War. We're going to play a part of his Vietnam Beyond Vietnam War speech that he gave a year to the day before he was assassinated here in New York at Riverside Church. I speak as a child of God and brother to the suffering poor of Vietnam. I speak for those whose land is being laid waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose culture is being subverted. I speak for the poor of America, who are paying the double price of smashed hopes at home and death and corruption in Vietnam. I speak as a citizen of the world, for the world as it stands aghast at the path we have taken. I speak as one who loves America to the leaders of our own nation. The great initiative in this war is ours. The initiative to stop it must be ours. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home, and I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. Our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile world, declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. With this powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo and unjust mores and thereby speed the day when every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. A genuine revolution of values means in the final analysis that our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing and unconditional love for all mankind. This off misunderstood this often misinterpreted concept, so readily dismissed by the Nietzsche's of the world as a weak and cowardly force, has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of man. When I speak of love, I'm not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I'm not speaking of that force, which is just emotional bosh. I'm speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is God. And every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, 
and his love is perfected in us, let us hope that this spirit will become the order of the day. We can no longer afford to worship the God of hate or bow before the altar of retaliation. The oceans of history are made turbulent by the ever-rising tides of hate. History is cluttered with the records of nations and individuals that pursued this self-defeating path of hate. As Arnold Tornby says, love is the ultimate force that makes for the saving choice of life and good against the damning choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope in our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word, unquote. We are now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now in this unfolding conundrum of life and history that is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at flooded ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is adamant to every plea and rushes on over the bleached bones and jumbo residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words too late. That is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. Omar Khayyam is right, the moving finger rights, and having writ moves on. We still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence, a violent co-annihilation. We must move past indecision to action. We must find new ways to speak for peace in Vietnam and justice throughout the developing world, a world that borders on our doors. If we do not act, we shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time, reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God, and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that the forces of American life militate against their rival as full men, and we send our deepest regrets? Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings, of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost? The choice is ours, and though we might prefer it otherwise, we must choose in this crucial moment of human history. As that noble bard of yesterday, James Russell Lowell, eloquently stated, once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, God's new Messiah, often eats the gloom a blight, and the choice goes by forever twixt that darkness and that light, though the cause of evil prosper. Yet this truth alone is strong, though her portion be the scaffold, and upon the throne be wrong, yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. And if we will only make the right choice, we will be able to transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of peace. If we will make the right choice, 
we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. If we will but make the right choice, we will be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream.